Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Going behind the scenes with Hollywood's power players. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Reba. Starts now. Hi there. Welcome to Real Hollywood Live. I'm Ben. I'm Reba. And we're here every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Time on UBNRadio.com, Channel 1. And you can find us between the shows during the week at RealHollywoodLive.com. Yes, and you know what? Because of that it's close to Halloween, I, I know it's a month away. I mean, I do know the calendar, but they're already starting. You know, you start with the pumpkins and, and you start with the spider webs. You have to think about horror films. Absolutely. Well, we, we're selling passes now to our online Halloween Horror Fest, where I love Halloween so much. It's one of my favorite holidays that I wanted to be able to celebrate being scared all month long, not just go to a haunted house once a night or be able to watch the film when it comes on once on the TV. I want people to enjoy it. 31 days of terror. With popcorn and a good drink. Absolutely. I, you know, did you like to be scared as a kid? I'm going to tell you something. When I thought about what we were going to talk about today, it's brought back a memory from when I was five years old. Mm -hmm. And I would go and sleep at my grandmother's house in a strange bedroom. I mean, because it wasn't home. And there was a tree next to the window and the when the wind blew the branches would rub across the window and I thought that the boogeyman was going to get me and I can't believe since everybody knows how old I am that I held this memory mm -hmm. for so many years and, and, and so with that was there one film that stands out as the scariest film that you remember from your childhood that had a profound impact no no Dreamcatcher was one. I was young enough when I saw Dreamcatcher, I refused to go to sleep for two weeks because I was absolutely convinced that if I fell asleep, someone was going to enter my dream and kill me, <laughs> and I would never wake up. Oh, well, the only thing I... I, I, I insisted <laughs> on sleeping with the, le the lights on, the lamps, it was, it was horrifying. And I never went to scary <laughs> movies, but I got to work on them. Mm -hmm. I got to work on Nightmare uh, 3, and I got to work on Nightmare 4, and, that was, and then I said to my husband driving in today, I said, um, did you go to those screenings with me? Because he says, I never go to foreign. I never go to horror films. I said, well, we worked on those films, and it's <laughs> you have an obligation. You have to go to the screening. He said, I never went. Oh. But I know somebody who did go. Um, I want to tell you about today's show, yeah. if you don't mind. Because it's about very it. special to me. Um, horror films, well, they can hold their own. And we're going to show you a clip from Nightmare on Elm Street. Actually, we're showing you B-roll from Nightmare on Elm Street. And um, they not only they hold their own, but they make money. Who would have thought? They make because lots of money. I was told when I first got into movie making that genre pictures is the best place for an indie film producer to be. Well, obviously, it's also good for writers. Okay, so yeah, they make money, <laughs> they make memories, and our guests today know all about what scares us. Boy, do they. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start with Les Wesley Strict, and he has been scaring us for a long time. It has nothing to do with age. It's just that you wrote Nightmare on Elm Street 10. <laughs> God, I got so excited. So did you grow up liking scary movies or... I grew up watching The Twilight Zone. As a kid, that was my big influence. Um, so, yeah, I like to be creeped out. I like the rug pulled out from under me in terms of, you know, narrative. I like twists. I liked irony, dramatic irony. I liked all of those devices that Rod Serling was so expert at. Did you think that that's where you were going to find your fate in a way, that you were going to become well-known and successful, mm. um, scaring people? I don't think I dared to dream about that, but I will say that he was probably my first idol. Um, I just loved the idea of this kind of dapper guy who would get out, up in front of the uh, camera and introduce the sh in, a, in a very cool way, introduce a show that was about to um, sort of question everything we thought we knew about reality. 
You know, it's really funny. I'm listening to you talk, and you seem very low-key and not the least bit scary, kind of soft in a way. How in the world is a guy that looks like you, mm. talks like you, get into let's scare the hell out of people business? I th well, it ha I think it happened uh, probably by happenstance. Um, I mean, I, the, the script that got me into Hollywood was a spec that I wrote back in 80, or sold in 83. Three, called Final Analysis. And it wasn't a horror script. It was a thriller. And it, I sort of styled it. I, I, wrote, I wrote the story with a friend named Bob Berger. He's a psychiatrist. And it's about a psychiatrist who ended up being played by Richard Gere. But I sort of drew from Bob's life and work. He, he was the um, head of the forensics unit at Bellevue, which is a kind of horrific okay. place in itself. But it's a place full of great stories. So we sat down one night, and I sort of deep briefed him about all of the great patients and stories and cases that he sort of had knew, known firsthand. And, out of, and we were both big film noir fans, and we loved Double Indemnity. But we also loved the recent Double Indemnity homage, which was Body Heat. So we thought, let's do something along those lines. And what we came up with was Final Analysis, which was kind of a gloss on both of those films. And I've got a little bit of a question, because obviously you started with your own work, mm -hmm. and then on Nightmare on Elm Street, you were carrying on someone else's work. What's yeah. the difference in the process between having to you know, take over with sequels versus creation yeah. of your own original? Well, night the Nightmare movie I wrote was, it's either a remake or a reboot. It's never been firmly established which one it is. Um, and it actually became a contractual legal question, ultimately. And if you're interested in that, I can talk about it. No. No. Okay. Forget it. I, I found it fascinating because I didn't really understand how important that was to to um, distinguish between. That, that, one that's and the a, other. that's a whole other show where it's like yeah. I. We'll bring in a lawyer to. Well, well yeah, yeah, that's that's where I've told every young filmmaker. It's like every which way that you could possibly be screwed is in your contract if you know how to read it. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I never looked at my. Contract. When you were doing this nightmare, whichever kind it was. Uh -huh. And it was done in ten. Wes Craven was still alive. Oh sure. So did you get to meet him? Uh, yeah, not in connection with that project. Though this is funny. I, I did a panel, a, a Writers Guild panel, with Wes. This is about eight years ago, maybe. Wes and um, jo Joseph Stefano, who wrote the script for Psycho, mm -hmm. who was pretty um, elderly at the time. And one of the reasons I agreed to do the panel was, I was gonna. I collect autographs of legends in the business that I cross paths with and I was going to bring my DVD of Psycho and have him ins autograph it uh, but I forgot it I was, I was left the house in a hurry and when I realized I'd forgotten about it I was annoyed with myself and I lost the opportunity because he, he died about a year later but uh, yeah I found myself on a panel with Wes Craven this is before the, I got involved with Nightmare and what was funny was that we, we chatted I think before and discovered that not only are we both Wesleys, but our middle names are Earl. Um, we're both Wesley, Earl, Strick, and Craven. And we neither of us believed the other, so we took out our driver's license and, <laughs> and, and looked. Um, but I felt a real kinship with him after that. It, it's so strange that we're talking about it. Last night in Toronto, Johnny Depp was interviewed for Black Mass, which we will show a clip from next week. But the thing is that he said that he owed Wes his entire career. Yeah. Actually, he owed Wes his daughter because she read the lines with all the actors. And when she got through, she said to her father, I want that one. Mm. And he said that Wes Craven was very brave mm. to put him in a film because he yeah. never considered himself an actor. But I always knew that you were a writer because you wrote a film for Robert De Niro mm. called um, Cape Fear. Yes. What was that like? Which part of it? The, oh, the bad part, of the course. Whole th the whole thing. <laughs> what was it like? Well, the amazing thing about it was that it was ultimately directed by Scorsese. Uh, it was originally, I, I was approached by Steven Spielberg to, to write, the, it's, and that is a remake of a film from the early 60s. And it was a film I didn't know. I'd never seen it. I'd heard of it with Gregory Peck and Robert Mitchum. Um, and when I watched the original, um, I, I didn't think it was for me. And I told them that, but Steven was... Uh, determined for whatever reason to have me uh, write the uh, remake. So eventually he twisted my arm and I did it. Uh, then he, for uh, it's complicated, he, he ended up doing um, Schindler's List instead. And Marty had been developing Schindler's List. He was developing Cape Fear. They swapped projects. 
So Scorsese took Cape Fear um, very unexpectedly. It just happened like one day my agent called and said, Scorsese's going to do this. That's something different. Now, but, but back, you know, kind of back on my previous question, yeah. the challenge of taking something that's old and rebooting it or creating yeah. a sequel, do you find that as enjoyable or more inspiring or less so than coming up with your own character and creating an entirely new world from scratch? It's a different, it's a very different process. You're, I always feel like when I'm doing an adaptation or remake, something like that, I'm um, solve. well, you're, you're, no matter whether you're doing something original or not, you're solving problems. Mm -hmm. um, because at, at every turn in a, in a story, there's a problem. And you're always trying to sort of get past that problem one way or another, either by, you know, using real logic or using movie logic, which is a little different than the logic we use in real life. Um, the rules are a little different. Um, and you have to just sort of figure out how you're technically um, going to manage that and going to convince the audience that your story makes sense, that it holds water, and that it's worth following emotionally. Now, now when you're writing, are you envisioning how you would shoot it and edit and have it sound and all those pieces? No, not really, um, because... I'm primarily a writer. I mean, I have directed a couple of things. A and, and when I know that I'm writing something specifically to direct, yes, of course, I, I think about you know, the, all the other aspects. But when I'm writing for somebody like a Spielberg or, Sc or yeah. a Scorsese, I'm happy to let them you know, No, no, I was just wondering in your yeah, process, like yeah. as you envision, as you're creating the story, if you have a picture in your head of what you would, ha yeah. would, you would see it as. I guess it's impossible not to because we think pictorially. And yeah, yeah uh, sure, I, I run the movie in my, in my mind. Um, but that doesn't mean that's that's informing sort of exactly how I'm writing it. Okay. I get I, you know what I get really involved in is um, sort of the, rith the rhythms of the script, the the beats that are that you feel in the dialogue and in the in the length of scenes and in the sort of what you know they call the montage. So in what scene follows the previous scene and what scene's going to come next. So you're establishing um, it's like a piece of music almost. You're establishing a rhythm, a melody, uh, something that the audience wants to follow and can follow. But that's also like directing. And I know you did direct watching and waiting. And we're going to just throw throw out there a small clip, okay. though it is very scary. i got to tell you when I watch it. So let's play that clip. Oh, okay. Somewhere deep in a red state, there's a small women's clinic. Three women are working inside. And one man is outside. See you tomorrow. short that I wrote and directed uh, about two years ago and played at film festivals across the country. Are you going to do it again? Are you going to direct again? Yeah, I want to do, s I actually want to do a feature again. I did my first feature 20 years ago. What took you so long to decide to do it again? I went to directing jail. <laughs> I went oh, to well, straight to directing jail. Let's oh, talk no. about directing jail. I didn't jail. pass go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, How did yeah. you get out of it? I don't know that I have yet, really. I went back into screen. I picked, picked up my screenwriting career again. Since then, I directed one other feature-length um, movie that I wrote, actually wrote as well. I didn't. I didn't write the feature. That I have to did. ask you yeah. because you you brought it up. Mm -hmm. What did you do to get in directing jail? I made a movie that most critics didn't particularly care for, and neither did the public. Okay. But I will stand by that movie. I think it's pretty good. Um, it was, if I dare say, misunderstood. A couple of critics. Got it. I mean, the New York Times liked it. Um, which well, was nice. I have to tell you something. I don't know where your head is, but I mean, I just looked at that. Mm. You didn't use words. I'm watching it at home. I got to tell you something. I was scared to death. <laughs> yes. Y y it's, it has an atmosphere, right? What do you like at home? <laughs> are you? I know you have children. Are, I do. Are you? More importantly, what's Halloween like at your house? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my kids are grown up and they don't trick or treat uh, anymore, at least not around our neighborhood. Do you get, do you get joy out of 
scaring the other kids who come to your house? <laughs> they don't, you know, I live in the hills, Hollywood Hills, and nobody comes to our door. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you something funny. Um, my father, who's no longer alive, but uh, we, there was a running joke, which was any time a f- movie of mine opened on a Friday, he would call me Monday and say, you seem like such a happy child. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that sort of sums it up. But I think the answer to your question about what I'm like versus the kind of things I write is that I, I must be channeling something very other than how I uh, behave in, in the world, you know, in my sort of normal life. Did you ever think about it? I mean, do you think, how comfortable are you? Well, well just look at that. You need, I didn't even see words, and yet I could feel it. Yeah. How comfortable are you with all this stuff that comes out of you? I'm not particularly. I mean, it, it creeps me out, too. I mean, it, I mean, Cape Fear is a great example. People will say to me, oh, I love Cape Fear. And I, I always say, really? I mean, do you love looking at car accidents on the freeway? Do you know what I mean? It's, to me, it's sort of punishment. <laughs> it's like, how could you actually enjoy that? Um, and most of the movies that I've written, um, I never watch them. I don't really, um, it's, for me, it's sort of not entertainment. Maybe that's partly because I wrote them and I just sort of see the mistakes in them. How, how do you oh. feel like the world, with, now that we have digital effects and mm. anything is possible, I think certain things have been lessened. How, how has that impacted the horror genre, in your opinion? I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I haven't thought about that, really. Um, and I don't go to see a lot of horror films either. Like at the core of it, what do you think is... Truly, truly touches people at the core of like to scare them. So I think, well, I think it's the fear of death, mm. or the reality of death, the you, on facing that, the fact that mm-hmm. we're all mortal. Yeah. On that note, are you, what kind of film are you writing for Vince Vaughn? <laughs> Something very different. It's back to the other thing I do a lot of, which is uh, suspense. Oh. And the suspense kind. So as much as I was influenced along the, the lines of horror uh, by um, Twilight Zone and Rod Serling. I think um, Hitchcock influenced me in the category of thrillers and suspense very, very um, profoundly as a kid. So the, the thing that I'm writing for Vince... Now, I wrote a, I wrote a drama for Vince um, that came out in the late 90s called Return to Paradise. I looked it up. Yeah. It was scary. I mean, I don't know why you think that's suspenseful. <laughs> well, it's not a horror film, but it is, it is dark. It goes to a really dark place. It's a good movie, and I think Vince is really good in it. So what happened is about a year ago, his sister, um, Victoria, who runs his company, re- called me out of the blue and said, you know, Vince would love for you to come in and pitch ideas for another uh, drama. And I, you know, walked into the office and gave them a couple of ideas, things I had sort of on the back burner. And they weren't really interested in most of what I was pitching them. Um, and I wasn't sure why. And then I went on uh, the internet to sort of look up what I hadn't talked to Vince or, or really, um, you know, thought about what he might be interested in for a lot of years. But I went on uh, online, and I, what I saw was that he, I didn't know this, he identifies as a um, libertarian. Well, sorry to cut this off. We're going to continue this in the third segment, but we do have okay. to go to a commercial break. Because our sponsors yep. are fabulous. They are. We, we've got, we'd like to thank Wagner Family of Wines for Conundrum Red and White. And Rove mobile, mobile Living Products. So I can travel and drink all at the same time. Yep. And, uh, and now, too, if you're enjoying horror, go to HalloweenHorrorFest.com where you can get a month-long pass online to enjoy 22 horror films from the comfort of your home cool. or fear from your home. <laughs> but we'll be right back. Fun. Conundrum has been turning winemaking on its head for 25 years. Conundrum White is the original white wine blend from California. Pair this exotic, versatile wine with everything from Asian cuisine to tacos. Conundrum Red is rich, full-flavored, and balanced, the perfect complement to dishes like pasta pomodoro, fajitas, and barbecue. You'll find Conundrum Red and White wines at your favorite restaurants, wine shops, or supermarket. Go to wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Again, that's wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Find your wine, find your adventure. Rove knows you're always on the go. So we make it easy to have the most basic luxuries at your fingertips no matter where you are. At home watching a movie, working out at the gym, or running around town. Yes, we are talking about having hot coffee and cold water available on demand. Rove makes everything better. Check out roveliving.com. That's R-O-V-E living.com. Rove, make life better. 
Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches is Reba Merrill's intriguing look at hidden Hollywood. Find out what movie stars are really like in this behind the scenes Hollywood tell all. The story of Reba's extraordinary life interwoven with an insider's look at achieving fame and success in the entertainment industry. A must read. Buy nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches at RebaMerrill.com, Amazon.com, or ask for it at fine bookstores. Nearly famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. You'll love it. take to write and direct horror films? A crazy childhood? A vivid imagination? Or just knowing what scares the hell out of an audience? I'd like you to meet Alex Braum. Now, who, are, are you related to Bram Stoker? I'm not. Oh. I am not. That, that, that would help, though. Yeah. But he has been scaring audiences for a long time. Okay. <laughs> Sit there and laugh, but now I'm going to ask you. And, and he also makes movies. I also make movies. Well, right. usually when you write and direct, you do. I mean, it's... it's you missed the joke. Yeah. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, oh, Bram that didn't. No, okay, no, forget no, no. it. He's been scaring people for a long time. He also life. makes movies. Okay, That's right. That's, what sorry, your, I guess. <laughs> what was your childhood like? You know, actually, one of the very first things I ever obsessed about was movies and and films. And I've actually never told anybody this, but one of the very first things uh, I started to do, one of the, my first memories was I started to watch all the old movies. And I got to a point where I can tell you the release date of any film from about 1929 to 1978. And I did this as a seven-year-old. And I don't know what it was that drove me to do that, but I just became sort of obsessed with these old black and white films and, and all of them. And I, I would sort of pick an actor like Edward G. Robinson and just kind of watch all his movies. And then I'd go to John Wayne and then I'd go to, you know. Did you do Bella Lugosi? Because I did Bella Lugosi. Okay, you started so off as a stage actor. Or? I'm going to be your therapist Please. for this moment. <laughs> Were you bullied that you had to hide behind the this fascination with those particular kinds of characters you saw on the screen? You I wasn't make... so much bullied. Uh, I think what I what I learned pretty quickly was that through humor, I was able to to ingratiate myself to the bullies. So they didn't beat they, you up. They wouldn't beat me up because they they had horrible senses of humor and they needed me around to sort of impress the girls. I guess is what it was. I don't know what it was. But you that. got even. You oh, got even with them because I... now you scare the out of them. Yes, I, I get even to this day. There's a there's a script where I was looking for a for a bad guy name, and this person. This is now we're flash forwarding to to current day to to this past year, and I, I needed a name for my bad guy, and I picked someone who'd piss me off in real life, and he is my bad guy name. Oh, so don't. <laughs> Don't mess with me is what I'm saying. So I was going to ask, you. Well, I guess you know that... So what's the name? Oh, I, I don't want to say no, that I just for say because reasons. My, my lawyer's listening. Okay, but the thing it's is that be I in thought... It's going isn't it? Yeah. But I'll have a few movies so people won't be like, which one Well, we're going to show something from uh, Body of... it's not Ben. <laughs> it's not Ben. And it certainly isn't Reba because I'm a girl. No, okay, no, but... but you're a great horror writer, too. <laughs> yeah, right. She pulls from experience. <laughs> Do it to me. Then he's going to say, and what did I do? Oh, you have to read Tales from the Hollywood Trenches to see the horror. <laughs> I want to. Okay. That sounds bone let, chilling. Let me get even with you. It's a Here. horror sex thriller. <laughs> <laughs> Subgenre. Uh, let me show a clip from Body of Work. <laughs> Play the clip, please. Speak simply doing work for hire. Mark? There really is an art to the Scream Queen, isn't there? 
There is. Yes, indeed. Yeah. When we auditioned, we, we, we heard them. You yeah. audition the Scream Queens? Uh, I'm not sure if I... Uh, no, you know what? I think I think we probably did. We probably did audition that, yeah. Well, you opened your big mouth, and oh. you said, quote, that you're going to bring suspense and surrealism back to horror. That's right. Could you translate that? Sure. Well, let's take uh, Wesley, your, your first guest who, d- who did Cape Fear, and just mention that that's, that's what I want to do, is basically go to, to a time. That was a film that was, well, it, it was a remake for one. But it also, took, it also took the lessons of the old masters like Alfred Hitchcock and Brian De Palma and others and brought them into the modern age. And, and that's what I, I want to do. I think right now, in, in at least theatrically, the horror movie is, is sort of relegated to basically the found footage genre, and that's basically all you'll see in the theaters. I want to bring it back to that day. If you look at Cape Fear, there are Academy Award-winning performances in there. There really were. Juliet Lewis, De Niro. Well, that was just another movie for De Niro, but there were plenty uh, of Academy Award worthy performances, and and there are in the movies that I, I love the most deeply: Jaws, The Omen, Rosemary's Baby. All of these contain not just cheap scares and thrills, but suspense for one thing. That's one of the main ingredients that I, I also agree. Uh, and I'm actually more interested in suspense than I am about horror. Um, I, we started talking about my childhood when I was ten or so. My parents took me to see Jaws, and it traumatized me. I was so scared that I had to leave the... the this was back in the day when, when a movie theater screen was all-encompassing in a giant thing, not a phone. Anyway, uh, and at that time as a is, child... Is, is I, it really a different experience there? It, it was Well, it was all-encompassing. And, and, <laughs> and by the way, I'm from Miami, so sharks, water. We used to go into the water for pleasure. I was a 10-year-old. And it traumatized me, and I've, I've used the whole rest of my life to figure out why did that happen to me? Why was I so scared that I had to leave the theater and wait in the lobby a little while? Well, then, what does that have to do? Does any of it appear in Carnival or Darkness or Cloudland? I don't know either sure. one. Sure. Um, so I've... Basically, where I am in, in my career, I've done a lot of uh, short films. And as I started doing the short films, I got interested in them, and Carnival of Dark... Darkness is actually a short film festival that we used to run, actually, kind of in this neighborhood at the LA Film uh, at the LA Film School uh, down the street here, and it was horror shorts from around the world, and I would see thousands of films from from across the world. So that's what Carnival of Darkness was. That wasn't an actual. And, and out of thousands, how many of them? succeeded in truly being scary oh they were well <laughs> many of them were scary for other reasons you're surprised <laughs> when you give someone a camera what they're willing to film and send you <laughs> here i am in the bathroom so you know you'd be surprised um so a very i think, I think very, youtube killed shock and awe uh, now you've got to have more than that what's shocking yeah um but but anyway so no you you'd see what was successful successful and what wasn't most mm-hmm. of it wasn't successful and you really have to to, I can tell when I watch a film or a TV show if this person, if this filmmaker knows to do what they're doing. Uh, I do this all the time with new TV shows or whatever. Within about two minutes, I can tell these people, this is a good operation. This is a worthwhile thing for me to invest my time in or not. What is Cloudland? It either works. Now, Cloudland is a script that, that is currently in development, and that is a, that's a full feature that's uh, aimed now, for Now, is this in real development or development hell or... In that, your mind? That one is development. I have a, another uh, screenplay called New Breed, which is a werewolf, and that we've gotten a, um, a, an investor signed on to. I'm about two weeks from seeing, uh, I should say, I mean, don't I'm scoop. right there, so I don't want to okay, jinx don't, it. Don't, no, that's don't. It. No, I'm, I'm just un- excited that you're yeah. making a werewolf film because we, we've got our horror fest running and of all the submissions, I had a werewolf category. I had no submissions in the werewolf category. Good. Let's keep it that I, way, everybody. I, I, I thought, <laughs> That's I thought, enough with the werewolves. Yeah, I, I just thought, well, If I you're thinking of writing werewolves. a werewolf script right now, do not. Because Alex is on top of it. I got it covered. Okay. Well, I, I, I copied this quote because I was very moved by it. I should, you said it. Boredom is a silent killer. Art saves lives. This is a very deep man. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I think it's completely true. It goes to 
uh, National Endowment of the Arts kind of thinking and ideas that this is a national security. Like it really, I really have a deep feeling about this that that arts should not be cut and it should not be minimized because I mean, literally, it, it can literally save someone's lives. It can teach you something about whatever your parents or your home or your hometown or war or whatever it is. It can really pull you out of a of a deep dark gutter. Well, the boredom I think comes from having too much. In, in the technology is they you walk on the street today I don't think people pay attention to the world around them they're all looking down I'm amazed that more people don't die falling in holes because they didn't know there was a hole there I do you know I and I think this stuff is boring now maybe it's because I'm too old to appreciate that but I can appreciate a film maybe they're watching films on it <laughs> god how scary is that films about holes Yes, you I know. think there I think what it, called that. Oh. I think what what inspired me to write that actually I one thing as a director that I like to do is expose not expose myself but expose <laughs> myself to a lot of that's another story uh, expose myself to all speaking different of, kinds speaking, of speaking of horror <laughs> <laughs> all all kinds of different art all kinds of different music I don't just you know I'm not just horror I, I go see plays I you know what I mean I go see all kinds of things so I saw this play on Columbine. And that's what made me think of it. I thought of those those kids who just wanted to be somebody, and I think they were a little bored. And so what a better way to, to, to get on the news. I mean, this, this is going real dark, but these are the kind of things that I, I consider is, is if people had a purpose in their life and something that was driving them forward, maybe they wouldn't be criminals. So do you look at, like, you go see Annie and you start to envision, like, what if Annie had a machine gun and could take out Miss Flanagan? And <laughs> I more think violent thoughts of the people who made the last Annie uh, remake. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, some films don't need to be remade. <laughs> but Annie the, the play, wonderful. But the thing is that we we discussed and <laughs> I'm just joking and discussed your childhood and where some of these things are coming from in your brain. I, I just have to ask, what does your mother say? Can I just ask you because my, if you were my kid, I think I would say, what did I do wrong? I have a story <laughs> for you. I was probably 12 years old. I remember this, and I, so my, first of all, let me just, my mom, huge horror fanatic, oh. so I remember I was about 12 years old, and, and my mom, you know, I was sleepy, and I had school the next day, I think, and my mom said, let's go watch the Evil Dead Midnight Show, and I'm like, <laughs> Mom, I'm tired, and she dragged me to see the frickin' Evil Dead, and we laughed our asses off. That's my mom. So she force-fed me horror the way other parents force-feed, you know. Food. Geometry homework or, or something. whatever. Yeah. So, well, of course, so. when you're uh, you're half asleep, then it kind of comes in subliminally, and then you actually think it's part of your real memories. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that? here's a question, and I, I guess I should have really asked both of you, but as a screenwriter, if you kill someone, does it affect you as well? In uh, here's what I consider. I really, as now I'm talking. Okay, as a screenwriter, no, I'm excited because. I'm excited because I know it's, a, especially if it's an exciting scene, but as a director, I need to make sure that all of the actors surrounding this killing take it in. I think this is one thing that gets lost in, in the in the sort of um, adventure, you know, Bruce Willis. And, I, you know, wh by the way, when I mention these other films and things, I love them, so we're just all kind of talking craft here. Uh, I'm not putting them down, and I consume them just like everyone else, but when you go see a Bruce Willis or a Schwarzenegger or a Stallone film, when they kill people, that's followed by a wisecrack. I'm not sure when you really kill someone if that's what your first thing on your mind is. I think more you're thinking, holy crap, I just killed somebody. And I think everyone around the killing should at least soak it in. Wesley, I'm going to put you on the spot. Come closer to the mic. Okay. What do you feel? I mean, because Cape Fear had some really interesting murders. Yeah, and the, uh, that one. And disturbing, the one too. And I agree with what you're saying. I, th I think there's a responsibility to not trivialize violence and murder and brutality. Um, the, of course, the, the problem there is that we're making entertainment as well. So you don't want to introduce too much um, angst and mourning. Uh, you know, the, the emotions that would happen in a genuine act of violence. Just what? Two scary writers, and they have a conscience. So <laughs> maybe this is the perfect time to go to a commercial break. Absolutely. Well, and with that... Any any pre any problems you have with your conscience? Conundrum. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and here's to my Commander wonderful guys. All. Thank yes. you, Wagner Family of Wines, and also to Rove Living, and we'll be right back. Conundrum has been turning winemaking on its head for 25 years. Conundrum White is the original white wine blend from California. Pair this exotic, versatile wine with everything from Asian cuisine to tacos. Conundrum Red is rich, full-flavored, and balanced, the perfect complement to dishes like pasta pomodoro, fajitas, and barbecue. You'll find Conundrum Red and White wines at your favorite restaurants, wine shops, or supermarket. Go to wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Again, that's wagnerfamilyofwine.com. Find your wine. Find your adventure. Rove knows you're always on the go, so we make it easy to have the most basic luxuries at your fingertips no matter where you are. At home watching a movie, working out at the gym, or running around town. Yes, we are talking about having hot coffee and cold water available on demand. Rove makes everything better. Check out roveliving.com. That's R-O-V-E living.com. Rove, make life better. Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches is Reba Merrill's intriguing look at hidden Hollywood. Find out what movie stars are really like in this behind-the-scenes Hollywood tell-all. The story of Reba's extraordinary life interwoven with an insider's look at achieving fame and success in the entertainment industry. A must-read. Buy Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches at RebaMerrill.com, Amazon.com, or ask for it at fine bookstores. Nearly Famous Tales from the Hollywood Trenches. You'll love it. And now we're going to have a few words from Freddy Krueger. You know, the star from Nightmare on Elm Street. He said, you know, a bad guy never knows he's a bad guy. Iago doesn't think he's the bad guy, you know. And Freddy doesn't think he's the bad guy. Freddy's got a beef. You know, these parents scarred me. You know, this is his beef. And I'm going to get their kids for that, you know. I got off fair and square. Those lawyers got me off, and Freddie's got this legit beef, you know. So Freddie, you know, Freddie doesn't think of himself as a bad guy. Well, when you write a villain, do you try to see the good side of him? I mean, this, this was a quote from last night from Johnny Depp, who was talking about Nightmare on Elm Street, and he says, no one wakes up and says... I'll be evil today. But you two guys, I don't know. Maybe you do wake up and make your guys, you have to have, they have to have some redeeming feature. No? Yes? Well, what I try to do is give my villain a justification. That to makes kill? sense. To do what he's doing. In other words, yes, he's not just making mischief, doing evil, um, wrecking lives. He has a quest that, in his mind, his version of reality, makes perfect sense. And, and that's, that was sort of the big story thing that I brought to the remake of Cape Fear. Um, the idea that Nick Nolte had, had been De Niro's lawyer. In the original Cape Fear, it's a much simpler thing. He was, he was stalking the um, prosecutor, the guy who put him in jail. In the remake, um, Nolte had represented De Niro, but De Niro had discovered while in prison that Nolte had buried a piece of evidence that would have exonerated him in, in legal terms. So he had every right to be to kill him. <laughs> to be outraged. Now, now, do you think that it's it's easier or harder to have like a, a monster like Jaws or you know a creature that doesn't necessarily need a motivation except that it's just what they're wired for versus a person, which which well, as you said, you give them a justification. Well, What's interesting is, I mean, if you're interested in Hitchcock like I am, I think Hitchcock mm -hmm. always went to town with villains who were um, psychopaths or sociopaths, mm -hmm. got, uh, mostly men, without a conscience, who didn't ha really have a, a sense of right and wrong the way most of us do. So they're operating in their own moral universe, in which o the only thing that matters is them and their um, satisfaction. Alex, your that's own a, that's universe? Half the men you work yeah. For. <laughs> 
I, I always try and try and think of, of the character's world. And like you said, they don't wake up saying I'm going to be evil today, but they, they all think they're doing right. I think a lot of times they think I'm going to clean up this nasty planet. Uh, I have uh, Cloudland is about a, a cult leader, so I've had to do a lot of thinking. It's funny, my, my cult leader, when I would when he would do his sermons and all that, he actually says things that I believe in myself, <laughs> and yet he's my bad guy cult leader. So they have you know they can't be they have to be a fully rounded human, and although they've set about to do something that is harmful to others, I mean we see this in politics currently. Anyhow, um, none of these people set out. They think they're doing the right thing for whatever reason, although they're they're misguided. And in a sense, I think just to Oops. build in the, that um, they're operating without the constraints that the rest of us operate with, where we're not going to actually do harm to people. We might fantasize about it. We might, in passing, Yes, there is that pretend. fantasy element. I'll get back at you. Mm -hmm. But here's the other thing. What do you think, if we could break this down to what scares an audience? How much of it is blood and gore, uh, silence, noise, or, in your clip, an ugly villain? <laughs> Anybody? Uh, I, I think it's not the payoff, but the lead up to the, again, I mentioned Jaws, what, was, what I've found after now looking at it my whole life is it wasn't scary when we saw Jaws' teeth and, and him chomping on Robert Shaw. That wasn't so scary. It was much more scary when we saw people swimming and we couldn't see what the hell was under their feet. That's what was scary when we didn't know that anticipation uh, is what's scary. I, I would jump in, too, and say it's the, it's the audio, it's the sound. Like that preps you. Like I, you know, I, I've seen a lot of films at the festivals over the years, and the ones that actually I found as an adult that were still the scariest were the ones where they knew how to use sound correctly. Yeah, I agree. That's really effective because it tends to be um, work on the unconscious level. Do you ever write in in either one of your scripts any moment of sound? I mean, we have to go back to Psycho. It was the strings that did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I do. Not Tony Perkins. <laughs> Not Tony Perkins. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure, sure. That helps. Do you, you write I that do, into I your script as well? Yeah, yeah. I found I, I befriended a a. Well, he's the vice president of the sound editors, Mark Lanza, and he worked with me on Body of Work, and so I knew I had him. And for that reason, I added a lot of you know her voice travels through the air in waves, you know. So because I knew he was on board, I amped up my script with, and he's 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 continuing to work with me. He's my sound. He's my sound person. So uh, that's what I like to do is find a good crew and team and, and continue to work with them, and that's what we're doing. There, you know, there's another subtle aspect of um, enhancing the level of dread in a uh, horror film um, that's, that's, all, that's just as subtle as, as sound cues, which is all about framing, composition. Mm -hmm. a, a great example of that is the way Polanski uses the widescreen frame in Rosemary's Baby, and there are scenes where he's framed the apartment in such a way that you don't see very much. You're desperately straining yeah. to see sort of around a corner or through a doorway, but he only gives you a bit of, like a tail end of somebody's cigar smoke yeah. or somebody's uh, silhouette, just half of their silhouette sticking out of a door frame. And it's just something you you know that is so mm -hmm. frustrating and um, compelling. I stole that in Did Body it. of Work. I do that where we mm -hmm. where you're like, go ahead, turn the damn corner, mm -hmm. and it's in Body of Work. I stole that from Polanski. I, right. Oh yeah. It's yeah. kind of a general filmmaking question, but I find it fascinating that we still look at Hitchcock and a lot of the classic film directors as you know the lessons and the mentors and the teachers. Has the craft been perfected for that long, or where you know why is it that what they set this the stage for back then still holds true as um, how things should be done today. Yeah, should be done, but really mostly aren't. Right. I, I mean, the found footage stuff and the handheld stuff all sort of th throws that away. Throws it? Did you say throws it away? Throws yeah. it away for the most part and turns it into sort of first person, you know, mm -hmm. filmmaking that replicates just what all of us can They're do. They're not but focusing on the right thing. This happens mm -hmm. a lot where a movie makes money and then they try and figure out why was that successful? And they looked at Blair Witch Project and mm -hmm. they thought the reason this was successful was because of the shaky camera. And it isn't. The reason right. Blair Witch Project was successful was because it was scary right. and people got scared by it. So then now we've been trying to recreate this this, we're looking at the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. The found footage isn't what makes these films successful. It's the fact that, you know what I, I also think I saw uh, The Visit over the weekend, the new M. Night, mm -hmm. and M. Night, who up until this point was doing uh, straight-based narrative fiction, this is a found footage thing. 
Go ahead, tell me. <sighs> but, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but um, I, I think what happens when you have found footage is, is the actors, now this could be resolved by good directing, but the actors are given license to act like a normal person. Just act like you're on a, you're on a video, I want this to appear like a home movie. So then the actor relaxes more and, and that's, what, what, that's what they're really looking for. But you could achieve this with a good film. Like Cape Fear. Well, <laughs> like like in Wesley, you, you spoke too. I think part of what made the Blair Witch work was that in the beginning, people thought it was real. Like when yeah. everything was on the internet, people didn't realize it was a movie yet, so it bought into the, the fear of death. That's right. It's the mythology that was built around the, right. the movie that people brought so much. Could I ask a I was going to say, but before we break from what it's worth, it, I don't remember which one of the filmmakers, but at Toronto Film Festival a couple of years back, I saw another film from one of the, the men who was involved in that. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a perfect film, but his knowledge of how do you sound, hmm. of all the films there in The Midnight Madness, it was the only one that I actually thought had a shred of being scary. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it showed that even though that set the tone for that, that they, these guys either had or developed some craft while they were at it at the same time. No. Yeah. Was that Eduardo Sanchez? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he it was like is, something Molly. He is Molly. going to direct Cloudland for me. <gasps> oh, okay. So he's my attached director for yeah. Cloudland. Great. Good I'm directing New Breed. Uh, so I'm writing, directing New Breed. I wrote Cloudland and Eduardo Sanchez is directing. So you see, I don't hate the, I don't hate found footage, no, and I love Eduardo, obviously. It's, a, well, it's, but it's like you said. It, they, they came across something that was good, and then everybody yeah. else tried to copy because they're like, oh, it, mm -hmm. that must be the new thing. Yeah. i got to ask this question before they throw us out. In Hollywood, because both of you are part of this breed, do you think everything is possible? Did you really think you were going to get your career, and did you really think you were going to get your career? Go uh, ahead, Wesley. Uh, You've had your older... Me, no. My career was a total fluke. Absolutely. I just fell into it. I really did. I, I got lucky. We always say that, that we got lucky. Did you get lucky, Alex? I think everything is, is possible. I Here's what I really think. I, I think you just got to keep going and creating art and, and just create, 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 create. I create lots of art that nobody ever sees. I create all kinds of weird shit all the time that nobody ever sees. But what that allows is... One day, someone's going to reach out and find it. And, and I was, you know, for this new breed, this deal that's happening, my, me and my script were at the right place at the right time. And so we got lucky. Right. And before we end, I must ask you, gentlemen, what scare, scares you and what scares you? The IRS. <laughs> the IRS. <laughs> Only if you, if you have something to hide. Oh, that's right. No, not the IRS <laughs> whatsoever. Wesley. That's just gags. What scares me? Um, everything. Everything. Life. The world. Wow. What scares you? Gosh, I don't know. Responsibility. Mm. Okay. I'm I, scared I, I think of committing to being, <laughs> to being married and having kids is the scariest thing I ever did. Oh, I already got through that. <laughs> I'm in the next phase. I'm a grandmother. <laughs> that doesn't scare me Mazel at all. To. Well, I have to tell you well, something. What were bedtime stories like in your house when your kids were young? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we stuck with the classics. We were like actually the shining. I, I'll, no, no. I'll tell, you something, I'll tell you something really embarrassing. My wife and I t took turns reading Charlotte's Web to the kids, and I got the last section, and I couldn't finish it. I, I choked up. So emotion is a very big part of who Wesley Strict is. Emotion. Emotion is, yeah. And you're not embarrassed by it. I mean, guys, especially yeah. New York guys, probably were never allowed to even show it. Well, we show it through art, I think. That's the way we expose uh, our emotions. Yeah. Because Alex, he makes me feel that he exposes himself through humor mm -hmm. and then hides, wraps it up in, in horror or suspense. Mm -hmm that you're playing this game with us. Do you feel like you're playing a game? Absolutely. <laughs> game of life and enjoying it, too. I like the idea that you're getting even. Did you ever think about that maybe you were getting even? I don't know how you grew up. Um, I thought maybe I could convince some of the girls who didn't go out with me that they'd made a big mistake. <laughs> well, your wife will tell them <laughs> that they really did make a big mistake because you have one of these Hollywood marriages that actually work which yes. for itself is a miracle. Because when you go on a film set, do you, as the writer, do you go on the film set? Or once you write, you let it go? No, I'm usually around, um, unless I've been replaced. But you know, Sonny, and I have to say this before we end, as an EPK producer, or producer of electronic press kits, every time I was on the set, I always wanted the writer. 
because you told the Good best stories. So listen, guys, when you do your EPKs, please make sure you're on the set that day that the producer's there so they can have the pleasure of interviewing you. I think the Gilda has a <laughs> policy about that. They have that you have to be on it. Yep. Well, it's about time. See, I worked in the old days, and <laughs> right. it wasn't true. Back then, it wasn't even an electronic press kit. It was just a press kit. It was a press kit. No, <laughs> I was always <laughs> electronic. <laughs> I was so electronic. I got to talk so about next week. Next, I, uh, next week. God, I know. want to thank you guys. God, did I have a good time with thank you guys? You. Exactly. Okay. Oh, Tune yeah. in next week at 1 p.m. Pacific time on ubnradio.com channel one, uh, where we're going to be talking to legendary actor. Uh, Ted Neely and writer producer Josh Isaacson. So, with that, you can tune in to see this program as well as others at realhollywoodlive.com. And again, thank you to Conundrum Red and White, Wagner Family of Wines.com. To Rove, so Rove I can Living. travel and drink. Exactly, with their special double lock system to prevent you from spilling. <laughs> and, and to if, our great guests. And if you thank love you, Reba, thank horror you, films, or please, suspense. Yep. Yeah. If you love the genre of films, go to HalloweenHorrorFest.com where you can enjoy 22 films all month long in October. Yeah. And you know what I get to do at the end of the show? What? I get to say, that's a wrap. Gentlemen, Cheers. thank you. Thank you. Real Hollywood Live with Ben and Reba. Ben and Reba.